Good morning, welcome. So when I was preparing this presentation, I was told multiple times, Adam, you have to start with a joke. And I'm really bad at jokes. But uh, luckily, uh, life writes unexpected scenarios. So who planned to come with public transport today? Thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was there on the tram platform and so, right need, right need, right need. And um, that's a great parallel for a highly available redundant system, the public transport. You immediately switch over to a different route, to a different uh, solution. You test in production and you come without affecting the end user. At least the ones that are not here are not to tell the story. My name is Adam Michalik. I'm a, a principal engineer at Rabobank, and I'm here to, tell, uh, to share a story about building data-intensive applications in my team. So what is it that we are building? It's a highly available storage platform, basically for all the transaction history of the bank. And you can imagine each one of you is using a, a bank app, I'm sure. When you make a bank transfer, if you don't see the transaction reflected immediately in your history, you think, oh my god, they stole my money. If you don't see your transaction history, you think, oh my god, they stole my money. So anything that happens in your account we, has to be reflected immediately just to keep you in a good mood. We are getting about 1,000 transactions per second, both reads and writes, on a regular day. During peak days like uh, Black Friday, that's, that's even higher. During paydays, that's also even higher. Um, we store the eight years of history. All the transactions coming in and coming out of the bank, that's about 20 terabytes of data. Who works with a database with a comparable size? 10 terabytes? Who works with 100 terabytes? I want to hear your story. <laughs> the lifetime of the project is plans to go over multiple years, so we have to build a stable solution. It has already been running for a good several years, six, eight maybe. Uh, and there's no end of life for that uh, planned yet. And uh, just a small remark, the data is expected to be non-relational, so depending on the use case that you might have, it might not apply. Uh, but in our case, uh, that's by design. And that drives the technical choices that we made for the, for the application. And I must say that uh, we are very successful with our project. The success didn't come from the first day, of course, we learned over the years. I want to share those learnings today with you. Uh, and some criteria for the success that we have is that we provide the correct data scope, not more, not less. We deliver great performance because we provide the data to the user-facing applications, to modern applications, so the users expect the data to be there immediately. We are not the source of truth so the whole uh, source of truth sits somewhere deep there in the in, uh, mainframe systems of the bank, but we are the modern solutions that the modern applications can plug into and consume with a well-known technology with a REST API. We need to be highly available, reliable. We also want to provide excellent client support. There are multiple teams consuming our service, about uh, 50 services. We want to be there for them because they are user-facing and we are a building block for them. So we want to help them with their success. And we want to grow. So the more people use uh, our application, the more teams use our application, it's better for us. And having all that, we want our own team to be happy. So we want to have mechanisms in place that allow us to sleep at night and work happily during the day. And with that, I want to share 
some ideas for your projects that might help you to bring all these uh, success aspects to you. Maybe the use case is not exactly what you have in your project, but the ideas behind what I will say are portable and uh, you can pick and mix. So there are three pillars on which we build our success. A reliable service, the foundation, the technology on which we build, reliable processes that we have when we develop and deploy our application, and the team structure and the mechanism that we have within the team. So the first building block, reliable service. The system in the big picture is fairly simple. We are ingesting data via Kafka streams. The ingester does some transformation to a common model, stores the data in an OpenSearch cluster. And OpenSearch is an AWS flavor of Elasticsearch. We have a REST API exposed in front of that that acts a bit like a proxy for the clients, and the services are, uh, are using that REST API. So it's actually pretty thin application layer surrounding a core of uh, OpenSearch cluster. And for the processes around that, we have tooling implemented in Azure DevOps. So the most important step that we took to make it a successful service is moving to the cloud. We used to run uh, on an on-premise setup, but that brought a lot of work to our team, a lot of low-level operational work. We were able to just move it to the third party. So much stuff is automated in the cloud that the total cost of ownership becomes way lower. We can focus on what actually our system needs to be doing on the essential complexity and all the accidental complexity that comes with the low-level setup of the servers of the cluster, this is all handled. So in the end, it is really cheaper to go to the cloud. Whenever there is some discussion with the management, I had that in my previous companies, the total cost of ownership is underestimated. And we are happy with that. The, the level of service that we get from the cloud provider is, is excellent. What's more is that the cost adapts to our needs. We can scale up, scale down whenever we see that, it's, uh, that there's need for that. Try to do that with an on-premise setup. Like I said, we are the building block on which other services are building their services. So how our application works impacts a plethora of other services. Our availability impacts others' availability. And you can see that with the microservice architecture, with every layer of microservice, the availability somewhat naturally degrades. There is always a network call that can go wrong. There is always a bug that can be introduced by every layer. So the better your building block is, the, better, the more impact you have on the other layers. So how can we set up our application in a way that the availability is maximized, that we can impact the other services in the most positive way? The most important thing to think about it is the intrinsic high availability provided by a distributed data storage. So how did we used to do that before? There's all, there was a failover for relational databases, for example. Now, with the NoSQL approach, the reliability is kind of built in in the concept. A cluster is multiple servers working together to form one entity, one database. Whenever one node, so one server, dies for some reason or is underperforming, the other nodes are taking over. So there is no active-passive, there is no active-active failover. It's just multiple nodes working together, providing the power to the overall solution. That's the basic setup of OpenSearch. However, 
with the AWS deployment, you get even more high availability. So, you know, if you deploy all your nodes to one data center, to one availability zone, there are diggers working in the ground that can dig up a cable. That happens. And then your whole data center is offline. With the setup in the cloud, you deploy automatically to three data centers, to three availability zones. And whenever one gets offline, the other two take over. You can even have your setup made in a way that one of the availability zones is always on standby. Then it doesn't receive the requests, the incoming traffic, the, the queries, but whenever one of the AZs uh, becomes unavailable, it immediately picks up the traffic. So that way you can bring your uh, high availability SLA from three nines to four nines. For the most demanding workloads, that is practically invisible to the end user. We apply this solution to the hot data, the most important data, the most used data. It comes at an additional cost because you have to have additional nodes that are not used, but then uh, you get the additional high availability. For the other data, we have warm and cold clusters, and they all work to the, together as one. You can make queries across multiple clusters and combine the data that happens automatically. So with the data that is less frequently used, like your transactions from eight years ago, who scrolls that far in your transaction history, that happens only once in a, in a while, you can still make one query and get data from all of the clusters. It also mitigates the operational risk. If we want to upgrade the database engine, we do it on the cold cluster first. Then it only is accessed infrequently. If an error pops up, it affects not a large user base. On top of the multi-cluster setup, we build that REST API gateway. It's a very thin layer, it's a proxy. We don't modify the queries, so we allow our clients to run any query they find suitable. We only review it. But having that layer of abstraction, we can route the traffic in a way that the clients don't need to know on which cluster the data is sitting. We can also plug in metrics, and we can uh, assure network security. So only the REST API is allowed to connect to, to the clusters, and the end users only are allowed to connect to the REST API. And having that in our setup, we are able to transparently move the data between the clusters without the end users knowing. And then just uh, switch the route if they request the data from two years ago, maybe it's on the hot cluster, maybe it's on the warm cluster, they don't need to know, just the REST API knows that. So this is how the infrastructure ensures the high availability of our service. Now, we as a team are responsible for the data layout, how it is spread across the cluster or the multiple clusters. And how can, how can that be done in a reasonable way to have a good cost and to have very good performance? It's a balancing act between the high availability that you want to achieve and the cost that you want to pay. So the first most basic way to, to uh, divide your data in manageable chunks is partitioning. It's a logical approach to what your data actually is and how you can divide it into smaller manageable chunks. For example, credit card transactions are different from your current account transactions. So you would rather keep them in two separate indices, two separate data sets. However, the payment transactions, there's a huge volume of them happening on a daily basis. So it's not very practical to always move around and, uh, and manage a humongous index of all uh, payment transactions for the whole bank. It's easier to divide those transactions on a monthly basis. So for each month you have a separate index, and if, for example, you want to 
shift your data to the warm, to the cold cluster, you do it on, an, on a monthly basis. That way, your data becomes more manageable, and if you want to introduce some kind of a change, you also can do that gradually. You apply it to the older data first, and then only once in a while uh, the end user fetches the data. If there's any issue with that, you realize it earlier, and only a small user base is affected. Then comes sharding. That's already a technical aspect of dividing your data. Because sharding is, defines how your single data set is spread across all the nodes in the cluster. You, you decide what is the volume of your data set, and then there are, there's an advice about how many chunks, how many shards that, that uh, index should have. So between 10 to 30 or 30 to 50 gigabytes, depending on your use case, is an optimal size for a shard. And then the shards are chunks that make up the whole index, and they can move around the cluster from node to node, depending on the load on the nodes. Uh, the more shards you have, the more parallelism you have when querying the data. However, the more shards you have, the more resources they use. So there has to be a balance between performance and availability. But with just a layer of primary shards, so just one copy of your data uh, split into multiple shards, you are not really protected against a single node failure. So a node holds some amount of data. When it crashes, the data is gone. For that, you need replication. At least a single replica is, is recommended for your data. And then a copy of the data resides on the same cluster, but in a different configuration of the nodes. So if one node holds shard A, then a replica of shard A is on a different node. If the first node crashes, then the replica is immediately promoted to being the primary shard and a new replica is created. That way, if a single node fails, you immediately get uh, access to the data still. You might want to protect yourself from multiple node failures, just increase the number of replicas. And an additional advantage to that is that the queries are made in parallel across the whole replica set to make up the whole index. So Elasticsearch routes the query in a way to access the least loaded nodes. So the, most replica, the more replicas you have, the more you can spread the load across the cluster. But again, that comes at a cost. The more replicas you have, the more uh, storage it takes. And that means that you have to pay for that storage by buying additional storage or by having more nodes. Uh, and also, like I said before, having more shards means using more CPU and memory, and you have to pay for that too. So there's always a calculation between your uh, SLA that you want to provide and the cost that you want to pay. And the main takeaways from reliable service is that it's key for the success of your own project and for the success of the projects that build, build on top of you. And if you are building a storage solution, then hopefully it will be used by a lot of other services. That's what you are there for. A lot of high availability is built in, in the network solutions and in the storage solutions. So it's mostly a matter of configuring it in the correct way. Just keep an eye on the costs and optimize as necessary. Now, the second pillar on which we can build our success are reliable processes that we used within the team during development. And the first and foremost, I would say, is automation. Who made manual changes on production and caused a failure? I think I will raise two hands because it happened so many times. Well, in the end, we learn. In the end, we learn that if you introduce a manual change, 
Somebody else won't know about that, they will overwrite it, and it will fail. So now we automate everything. We automate the environment provisioning, we automate configuration changes. All the setup is stored in a repository, and changes are applied via a pipeline to the environment. And in the pipeline, we can have all the checks. Of course, we need some validation, we need security and compliance, it's a bank after all. But it's also a helpful tool for us to see the history of the changes, to see who did that, just to contact them, uh, maybe what was the reason, or can I override that change, tell me more. Um, as a, 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 it's always good to have that auditing for your own purposes, but also for the compliance purposes. If you need to roll back, it's easy as reverting a change in the configuration repository or just deploying a previous version from the pipeline. Next thing that we apply in our development process is constant updates. If you read the uh, Alice through the looking glass, maybe you remember there's a scene where Alice is with the Red Queen and the Red Queen says, you have to run really fast here to stay in the same place. That's what we do with the constant updates. Every several weeks, we just have a look, okay, new version of Spring Boot, bam, let's bump it by a, a minor version. Hey, Java 21 released just uh, uh, shortly ago. Maybe we are not upgrading tomorrow, but it's already on our radar. We are waiting for all the tooling to be available for uh, Java 21, and we know that uh, we want to upgrade sooner than later. Although I heard yesterday on the talk that uh, we should still hold off maybe a little bit, maybe until spring or so. And we see that with the newer versions, there is better and better compatibility with the modern infrastructure. So with Open Search, with Cloud Foundry on which we deploy, deploy our application, more and more is built in and we need to write less and less code, uh, custom code to support the, the environment. And it does get faster over time. It's noticeable by a fraction, but it is. Of course, we have security guidelines and security requirements that we have to follow. So um, yeah, the moment that there is a high security vulnerability, we fix it immediately. But it's also very easy to fix it at a constant pace and not uh, ad hoc or not on, with big jumps through the versions. When the log4j issue happened, was it two years ago already? For us, it was no issue, just a small minor update to the application. There were teams that were really struggling with that for, for several weeks. A very helpful approach that we have is that we don't have chain environments. We don't have test, we don't have UAT, we have unit tests, and we have production. It really helps us with building confidence in what we are doing in our development and in our deployment and in our automation pipelines. But that doesn't mean that we are reckless with what we do. We just do baby step changes. And we use shadow flow. So a shadow flow feature is a feature that works in parallel to the current active feature, it receives a part of the traffic, but it does not respond to the end user. So it just produces a response, and then that response is compared to the active feature's response. If it's the same, or if it's, if it's different in a way that we expect, then good, the shadow, the shadow feature has passed the test. If there are any differences, then we notice that on production. Because in every project I've been with that had UAT testing, the data on UAT was 90% garbage because you cannot use the real production data. Well, if you do that, you use the real production data, you use the real production traffic, you, use, you have a performance test out of the box. And if the shadow feature misbehaves, just pull the plug on it immediately. Nobody's affected. The only thing that you need to have is excellent monitoring. 
We are using signal effects for our metrics, so uh, all the Spring Boot metrics uh, are, are going via micrometer there. We built a lot of our custom application metrics, and we have alerts set up, uh, paging us via pager duty. Depending on the alert, uh, it can be just an email, or it can be an actual call uh, that might wake you up at night. I don't think that happened, luckily. And only when there is uh, an alert on the metrics, we look at the logs. So the metrics are our primary point of knowledge what's happening in the system. Of course, issues happen. That's mostly when we don't have a relevant metric for it. And a, sim a topic similar to testing on production is the gradual rollout. That's also a way of testing of production a slow introduction of the new version. So once we tested a shadow feature, we want to gradually override the current active version with the new version, and we use a blue-green deployment for that. Anyone else using blue-green deployments? Some people, 10% maybe. So with a blue-green deployment, we have the active version that receives the traffic. You are deploying the new green version, once the application is deployed, started, so you see the spring banner or your application started log, it's not receiving any traffic yet, but it has this backdoor route with which you can run your own tests or just peek around manually. Is it behaving? If that is fine, we are switching partial traffic to the new version. So the load balancer adds the new version to a pool of instances that serve the traffic, and then we can see that a fraction of requests are going to the green version. If there's any misbehavior, if the metrics are showing that something is green, uh, something is, uh, is not going right, then we just revert. But if we see that everything is as expected, we switch full traffic to the new version and discard the old one. That way, we can monitor the rollout in a, a maintainable way and a, at a slow pace. Yeah, like I said, a rollback is just switching back the load balancer and discarding the, the new version. So the important takeaways for this, automate before everything. Any manual change that you do, write a script, write a declarative approach, tool for that. We use Terraform for environment uh, management. So, for example, uh, managing our AWS resources or our Cloud Foundry resources. Never do manual changes. Upgrade as you go all the versions by the minor numbers, by the patch numbers. Test a little bit, maybe more if it's a major version, and you will be good. Monitoring are the eyes and the ears into your system, so think about that and plan up front, and test on production. It's really better, and it helps with the constant deployment flow much better than having chain environments. And the third pillar is the reliable team. I was asked when I gave this presentation earlier, Adam, are, do you think we are managers? Why are you talking about hiring people? I am talking about hiring people because it's the team's responsibility to have the right people. It's not a manager who says, this guy is joining tomorrow. It's your responsibility to find and vet the next person. So this is what we do. We never said we have to be unanimous, but it always turns out that we are unanimous when we agree for somebody to join uh, our team. So, we have a common bar to hire. We want a good Java developer. It's not really very sophisticated, but it turns out it's a pretty good indication of, uh, of a general attitude towards development. So, there are multiple approach to, approaches to hiring. We give a, a, a small home, uh, take home assignment and then uh, we review the code and have a discussion about it. 
maybe it's not ideal, uh, but it's, it gives us the right candidates and the right teammates in the end. Now, we do a lot, of more, a lot more tasks than just Java development, but we expect people will learn it on the job. It's no problem if you, have, if you never had contact with AWS. It's no problem if you never had contact with OpenSearch. It will come. But there has to be some common ground. What we are looking for is a diversity in skills. So something that we don't have in the team yet. Of course, it's great if we are able to use that, uh, that skill. But even if not, then uh, it's interesting to have somebody with a different perspective. So we are looking for that a little bit. And once we grew to a team of now five DevOps engineers, we can consciously hire for a junior position. So there's a, a junior engineer program at Rabobank, and we chose to participate in that to hire a, a junior developer into our team. That's something that doesn't happen spurliously. It's not something that is forced on us. It's something that we decided we have that capacity. Of course, there is a disadvantage to a fast scale-up of the team. However, with a reliable team, you have that internal capacity to have more workloads. I think we are mature enough and senior enough to just, uh, well, do more work if it's necessary, for a certain period of time at least. And when we do that, we really work together. So there were times when people were kind of insulated, not very consciously, but we saw that and we, we started reacting to that. We really don't want to leave any person behind we really don't want the bus factor of one. We are doing mobbing, we are doing pairing, and we do that all remotely. We work from home almost all of the time. And we explicitly, if we see somebody working on a single topic for a, bit, a few days maybe, we ask them, okay, can I join you? I want to join you. I want to know more about what you're doing. And sharing the knowledge is something that needs to happen on a daily basis. We don't want specialization, we want proficiency. It also helps that we are always playing the devil's advocate. So we know that our service is really exposed to the end users. We have a lot of ideas about innovation, but there always has to be somebody who says, okay, but uh, have you thought about how we roll back from that? What impact can that be? Just uh, keep the cowboys in check, and every one of us is a cowboy sometimes. It really is an autonomous team, because we have all the tools and the processes to be an autonomous team. We are building with that goal in mind. So we do everything from design to implementation to testing to standby as a team. Only for the generic solutions, for the generic uh, cross-organization aspects, we lean on the platform teams or f on third-party support. And we are trying to offer an excellent support for our clients. Like I said, about 50 services use our storage platform. Uh, that's about 30 teams use, uh, implementing those services. We are in constant contact with them. We offer multiple channels to contact us via Teams, via email, just chat. We want to be responsive. And we get a lot of praise for that, thankfully. Um, there's always a, per a dedicated person of the week who responds to the messages. But if that person is overloaded, it's the team's responsibility to be the support. There are days, we usually call that Monday morning mayhem when things happen. I don't know why that is, but it's always Monday morning. And then the, the whole team picks up. We coordinate pretty transparently. Having automated processes in place really helps. So we, of course, started with manual onboarding of new clients, uh, with uh, configuration changes that a team member has to do. 
But over time, we grew into solutions that the client teams can do themselves. They, for example, we have a configuration repository where every uh, client team is listed. If we want to onboard a new team, they make a fork of that repo, they make a change themselves, they make a pull request. When we approve that pull request, a pipeline runs, and it does all the necessary configuration to generate a new client and to send them uh, all the relevant information. Again, automation is a tool also that can be used for the, for the clients. In the end, mistakes happen. They don't happen a lot, lately at least, but they do happen. Sometimes uh, they are pretty tough. There have been issues where, uh, where our application has been offline for at least several minutes. Maybe the biggest one was uh, around an hour. Over the course of the last year, there were uh, four major incidents that affected the end users. That's not much, but it is noticeable. When that happens, we always do a post-mortem. We analyze, okay, how did it happen? There's always a very good argument, okay, there was a, a missing piece in our process, there was a missing metric that if, if only we had it, we would have known immediately. Or there was a metric, but nobody was looking. There was no alert for that metric. Constant tweaking of your processes and constant tweaking of your metrics helps with providing an excellent service. We keep a log of all the incidents so that we can review it once in a while uh, and, and learn from that. Luckily, an incident that happened once I haven't seen it happen again. And majority of the incidents has been a human error. Like I said before, manual config changes are the root of all evil, and that has been a, a, one of the biggest issues until we managed to automate all the manual configuration. Also, deployments. Right now, we do deployments via pipelines, but with manual triggers. So it's a controlled way, it's not a fully automated CD. We want to have it that way to monitor the uh, progress of the blue-green deployment better. Initially, we had deployment was just something that a single person could do, just click the button. But we noticed that there is a difference between when you are a driver of the deployment and you focus on, uh, on clicking the buttons, and if you are the pilot. So you just watch the logs, you just watch the metrics, and look for some uh, disturbance in the force, maybe. So we now do deployments with four eyes, at least. It's fast, maybe it takes uh, 10 minutes to deploy a single application through all the stages, the blue-green deployment, but uh, it gives us a lot more comfort. So the takeaways of building an excellent team are first and foremost, hire well. Choose the right people. The right people will build the success. Once we have them, they need to work together as a team, not as individual lone wolves. And building up that spirit of common ownership, it really drives the project uh, forward. When the mistakes happen, we have to learn from them. So to wrap it up, the three pillars on which we have built success and on which you can build success are reliable service, the technical choice that provides high availability, where you balance the risks that you want to take or the SLA that you want to give and the costs that you need to pay for it. The processes that you apply to your development and to your deployment. Automation above everything, Excellent monitoring that gives you a feeling that you are there sitting on production and not multiple hops away, far away in a, in a distance, not able to, to change production in any way. And testing in production. Production is the real thing. Use it. And last one, 
reliable team. This is the key to the success, the right people working together, owning the project together, improving constantly and constantly learning. Thank you very much. And I'm wondering if anyone has questions. There's a question. How are other teams deploying? Do they also have other environments, how they are integrating with us, or do they just go to production? Do we integrate there? There are several answers to that, because there's not just one way uh, that the teams are working. However, uh, the overall design is not to use chain environments. So the usual development process is work in isolation with mocks provided by uh, the teams whose services you consume. Um, there is kind of an integration demo environment where um, the developed branch of the front end gets deployed, uh, but that's a fully mocked front end application only, so no connections to the back end. For the backend systems, I think some teams sometimes build kind of an uh, integration environment, but that is discouraged. What is encouraged is using uh, feature toggles, split I.O. Uh, to deploy gradually. Just the same way that, uh, that I described here, the upstream service is deployed first. It's not used, then the downstream service deploys uh, the new feature with a feature toggle. They gradually start ramping up the traffic. Uh, sometimes we, uh, sometimes the traffic is um, is selected just, for example, for internal users. And that way, we gradually test on production. Uh, that also shows how the performance is uh, is behaving. Uh, so indeed, overall, as a principle, testing on production is the way that we work. Yes. How do you deal with fundamental platform changes or something that breaks in the mold? Fundamental platform changes. How do we do that? Um, we went through, I would say, three or four fundamental changes uh, since I've been in this project. They haven't been changes like I don't know, switching from .NET to Java. But the latest one that we did, upgrading from Elasticsearch to OpenSearch. It's not really a fully breaking change, but it's something that has to be done in a controlled way. Um, for us, we used uh, this shadow feature approach, but for clusters. So we built a new cluster next to the existing solution, we copied some of the data, we routed um, the new data into two clusters at the same time, and then we gradually started switching traffic to the, to the uh, new version. That way we saw if there's any, any end user impact, and that's what we are planning to do. Um, most of the time the solution is just uh, enough abstractions and then uh, you implement the new way you build something that is compatible with the new approach and uh, try to switch it in a transparent way. Any other question? Yes. The How long it took us to grow into this point uh, where we are now? From the beginning. <laughs> so uh, I think this project has been running for uh, six or eight years. So it's a constant process. And uh, we went through, for example, three years ago, migration from Azure platform to AWS. That was 
a lot of work, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of risk, and an increased number of issues. We learn from that. Uh, we are upgrading from Elasticsearch to OpenSearch. These are a different kind of issues. We learn from that. So there's never the moment that we say, we're done, that's enough. Uh, just uh, let it be and don't change anything. It happens. People come and go, so also we have to train new people into this uh, mindset. Uh, and always both on the side of people who have already been there in the team and on the side that's, uh, that the new people show, there are gaps that you have to fill in in your process, in documentation or in the way you work. Because sometimes you have this, uh, this approach, it has always been like that and it worked because everybody agreed to that, and then the new person doesn't know. So we are constantly learning. And, uh, there was another question, yes? How long does it take between a transaction when it happens and the moment that it's received in our storage platform? Very interesting. Um, our SLA is two seconds, but it's usually tens of milliseconds. So you can imagine you make a transaction on your phone, it goes via several services to the sort to the main booking system when the truth lies, then that main booking system produces some kind of an event that a transaction happened. It goes through several other applications. It goes to Kafka. It comes to us. We store it in Elasticsearch, in OpenSearch, uh, and then it's made available to the transaction timeline in your application. This whole round trip happens in tens of milliseconds up to two seconds. One last question, if anybody has. All right. If you want to chat, then uh, I'm here. But uh, other than that, thank you very much. Thanks a lot.